What's up, heathens? How y'all doing? I'm the Godless Engineer, and I critically analyze apologist claims to give you the best arguments and information so that you can stand up and use your voice. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Dr. William Lane Craig, and he has an opinion that is really, really dumb. He thinks that there is something that evolutionary theory can't explain. Here, let's see what we're getting into today. So I find that to be the most persuasive argument for thinking that the thesis of common ancestry um, is at least in part true. But then you would need a mechanism to give you common ancestry, and therein lies the problem. Yeah. Right. The question would be, is random mutation and mm -hmm. natural selection enough to generate these biologically mm -hmm. complex organisms from these common ancestors? So oh, Jesus Christ. Another dumb fucking thing said by Dr. William Lane Craig, who's not an evolutionary biologist, by the way. He just gobbles up whatever Michael Behe or some of these other creationists out there put out. Well, if you want to know why Dr. William Lane Craig fails yet again, then please stay tuned. If you want your own extra wallet, use the link in the description to get 25% off your purchase at extra.com. What are some of the major things other than design and morality that the general theory of evolution cannot account for? Wait, first of all, you're starting off on a false premise that evolution can't explain these things. I mean, I think that there's definitely an evolutionary explanation for why morality developed. There's also definitely an explanation for why things seem designed. I mean, I've expressed them on this channel multiple times, so right off the bat, the host here is starting off on a bad footing. For instance, with design, everything looks designed because our brains evolved in order to recognize patterns even when there aren't any patterns. To recognize something as being different than its surroundings. This was evolutionary beneficial to humans because it allowed us to survive in our environment. There's your evolutionary explanation for design. And the evolutionary explanation for morality is that it helped us grow as a species and develop into larger and larger groups. This morality or this basic moral foundation allowed larger and larger societies to form and thus the human race flourished. So there you go. Two things that you think evolution can't explain, but is already explained by evolution. All right. Cue Dr. Craig. Well, I think that it... Its explanatory mechanisms are heretofore inadequate. Random mutation and natural selection operate so slowly that it doesn't seem that this much biological complexity could have evolved on Earth in some 4.8 billion years. Uh, Citation fucking needed for this particular point. I have never seen anything anywhere that suggests that random mutation can't change a population of organisms at a rate sufficient enough to account for, you know, how long life has been. Here. In fact, when you look at the fossil record, the changes that we see from species to species is so slow and gradual that random mutation and natural selection, as well as other selection pressures like sexual selection, definitely account for the velocity of changes that occur. So, again, Dr. William Lane Craig, first thing that he says, completely fucking wrong. Um, indeed, John Barrow and Frank Tipler in their book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, list 10 steps in the course of human evolution like the origin of photosynthesis, the origin of an inner skeleton, the origin of mitochondria, 10 steps in the course of human evolution, each of which is so improbable that before it would have occurred or evolved, the sun would have ceased to be a main sequence star. It would have gone through the entire course of stellar evolution and incinerated the Earth. I mean, he kind of gave a citation for this particular thing, but I would also love to see what their evidence is of this because it just seems like they're just uneducated about statistics and how they work. Now, he says that it's vastly improbable that these 10 things would have evolved in sufficient enough time for us to find the diversity of life that we have today and not, you know, a burnt out 
piece of the universe where the star has exploded. And I say that this is a misunderstanding of statistical probability is that he says that it's just really improbable. That does not mean that it will not happen. That just means that it would take a long time for it to happen or to have a big enough set of things happening in order for it to happen, which is the exact case that we have for evolution happening here on this Earth. First of all, we have a large enough time span for a lot of events to happen. So even if the probability is vanishingly small, the amount of opportunities for evolution to have occurred and to have started are 100% likely. So that's why I say that this is a misunderstanding or direct misrepresentation of statistical probability. I would hope that any scientist that's researching this or putting out a paper would not fallaciously or maliciously put out there that these events would have to happen in a linear fashion instead of parallel. Now, there is a bit of linear to it being that time progresses forward in a linear fashion. But as far as when these events are happening, they happen in parallel. So in general, one event is not dependent on another event happening prior to that, unless you're talking about a very specific order, which is what he's talking about here, which is why the probability is so small. But just because it has a small probability does not mean that it won't happen. It will happen. This would be an argument from large or small numbers, and it's a very common apologist tactic when discussing this particular subject. So the explanatory mechanisms of current evolutionary biology seem to be inadequate to account for the biological complexity we see given the available time. Okay, can you please explain to us uh, why it is that way? Uh, it kind of seems at this point that you're just making an ad hoc or baseless assumption that the explanatory power of evolution doesn't really work on the time scale that we give it. Now, does it work on the creationist view of time? being that the Earth is only 6,000 years old and it was created by God? No, evolution wouldn't work on that particular model. But because the Earth is actually over 4 billion years old, it definitely does have the amount of time necessary for random mutation along with natural selection and other selection pressures to shape life on this planet into various forms like we have today. Bill, let me ask you a question about that too. I know you're investigating this whole... Um, Adam, empirical yeah. Adam question right now. Um, we were mutually, you actually spoke at an event at ETS uh, and I happened to be in the room and asked a question regarding theistic evolution. And my question was this, and I'd love to have uh, you answer this as well. My question to the theistic evolutionists was, what uh, evidence do you see for theistic or just for macro evolution of any kind uh, that could not equally be interpreted as evidence for a common designer or common creator. Yeah. Well, how would you answer that question? Before we get into William Lane Craig's answer on this, I would like to venture a possible answer. There are a few things that are wrong with the common designer explanation. For one, you have to assume what the intent of the designer was in order to venture this explanation. And unless you're willing to admit that you know the mind of God, then I really can't see you admitting to knowing the intent behind the design. Another thing that the common designer explanation can't really account for is the fact that all the structures that we find are slight modifications of previous structures, as if they slowly evolved over time or they were slowly changed over time. That, coupled with the fossil record showing us when exactly these organisms were living, it doesn't exactly seem like a common designer is a good explanation, unless you want to say the common designer just made the first cell and just let it go rampant. But then it's really no different than evolution. You're still admitting that evolution happened. Frank loves to make this distinction between micro and macro evolution, but in this particular context, it really doesn't matter. Evolution is evolution. Macro or micro, it's still evolution. All right, let's see what William Lane Craig has to say. I would say that the best evidence that the theistic evolutionists could offer would be features in the genome or the body plan of an organism which seem to be non-functional uh, and seem to be evolved from a common ancestor in which those genes were functional. So let me give one of the examples that Michael Behe gives. 
Mm-hmm. Olfactory genes that we and chimpanzees both have a uh, sense of smell are called pseudo genes. They're broken. They don't work anymore. And yet mm-hmm. and chimps have them. Why? Well, the best explanation seems to be that we got them from our last common ancestor who had these, and that therefore we both share these kind of genes, even though they don't do any good at all in our genome. Um, mm-hmm. To deny this, the creationist would have to say, well, God has chosen to design independently two organisms, chimps and humans, both with these broken parts in them that serve no good. It would be like saying that Ford and GM both designed independently a car with the same broken door handle in Mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I find that to be the most persuasive argument for thinking that the thesis of common ancestry um, is at least in part true. So what I take away from this is that you think that there are some things that a common designer explanation can't account for? Really? So I'm kind of curious, while William Lane Craig, even though he agrees that this is the best refutation of the common designer arguments, which to me would raise a lot of really good questions, why do you still hold to this whole creationist worldview there, William Lane Craig? It kind of seems like maybe you should take that and follow that particular rabbit hole to you know, find reality. But then you would need a mechanism to give you common ancestry, and therein lies the problem. Yeah. Right. The question would be, is random mutation and mm-hmm. natural selection enough to generate these biologically mm-hmm. complex organisms from these common ancestors? So, uh, Okay, so now what you're doing is kind of moving the goalpost of it a little bit and saying, well... Yes, that's a hard question for us to answer, but there's no actual process or method that would actually facilitate common ancestry. So, I don't know, this seems like a very weird position to take here, because it's like, oh, this is the best argument for it, and the fuck if I know why God decided to put those broke-ass genes in our DNA, but, you know, they're there, and he commonly designed it that way, because you don't have a good explanation for it. What? The fact is, is that we do have an evolutionary explanation for common ancestry that definitely works. They just want to claim that it doesn't work, and it seems like William Lane Craig here thinks the only reason why it can't work is because of how much time it takes. If you don't think that slow changes over millions and millions of years can change an organism, I don't know what to tell you, man. There are two separate issues here, Frank, Mm -hmm. that need to be kept distinct. One is Mm -hmm. the thesis of common ancestry. Do we, in fact, have common ancestry with other animals? Mm -hmm. And that's the least objectionable thesis of theistic evolution. Mm -hmm. Um, People like Michael Behe are quite ready to accept. Mm -hmm. Other question is, are the explanatory mechanisms posited by evolutionary theory, like um, random mutation and natural selection, Mm -hmm adequate to explain the evolution of biological complexity. And that, I think, is a much more difficult issue. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it might be difficult, but it's definitely not impossible, and it's definitely already been explained. I mean, it's not just natural selection and random mutation. It's a little bit more than that. You've got different types of selection, like sexual selection. You've also got different forms of random mutation that happen, like gene flow and genetic drift. So, I mean, it's not as simplistic as you're making it out to be. I feel like this just exposes how simplistic your understanding of evolution actually is. Because there are a lot more things that go into explaining how organisms have changed over millions of years. I mean, all you're doing is you're just laying out a general synopsis of what, like, Michael Behe says. I would not expect Michael Behe to be able to adequately explain evolutionary theory to anybody. Because he seems to have a very uh, rigid bias against evolution and for his own faith, meaning creationism. Yes, and I remember Stephen Meyer answering the question because he was on the panel too. After one gentleman of the theistic evolution sort gave the sort of answer you gave, 
uh, Stephen said, well, we've been investigating some of those broken genes and we've discovered we don't think they're really broken. So yeah. obviously you'd have to do that on a case by case basis. Who knows what the right answer is? But this, this seems to change every 10 minutes, it seems. Yeah, yeah this is, and, and you're exactly right. This. <laughs> you know what I find funny is the fact that religious people often shit on evolution and science because it changes so often when their religion has stagnated for them at a particular point in history. So just keep that in mind. They laugh at updating your worldview when new information becomes available to you. They wouldn't do this in any other area other than evolution and their Bible. This is what would need to be investigated. For example, the misnomer of junk DNA. Exactly, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm non-coding regions of the genome is vital in regulatory uh, function. So um, you're right. One mustn't jump to conclusions. Uh, mm. in regard. Now, what they're referring to here with junk DNA is the idea that non-coding DNA is junk DNA. But recent research has kind of overturned that and has shown that this non-coding DNA does actually have purpose in regulating some genes out there. For those of you that don't know, our DNA is made up of about 1% coding DNA and 99% non-coding DNA. Now, coding DNA would be the DNA that codes for the production of proteins. The non-coding DNA would not be used for encoding these proteins. Now, these non-coding DNA elements have been shown to come in a variety of types. There are promoters, enhancers, silencers, and insulators. But the more important issue here is that they're framing this change in our scientific understanding of DNA with somehow being bad. That, you know, you can't trust science or evolution or anything like that or anything that scientists say because it's liable to change. Whereas their Bible, their theology has stagnated at a certain point in time and you will always get one particular answer no matter what new information comes up. I'm sorry, but if new information comes up that disproves old information, I want to adopt the new information so that I can have a worldview that's closer to the truth of reality. They seem to want to be stagnated so far away from what we understand reality to be that it's totally disconnected from reality. Thank you, heathens, for joining me today. I really hope that you liked it. If you did, let me know down below what you thought about this video. Do you think that William Lane Craig has good answers? in this video? I mean, I don't think so, but I'd love to hear what you guys think. While you're down there though, why don't you smash that like button and subscribe if you like this kind of content. Don't forget to stand up and use your voice. Bye, heathens. Linearly and not parallelly. Parallelly? Is that a fucking word? Parallelly? What are we in? A goddamn children's show?